Thank you for joining us for this informative American Institute of Chemical Engineers webinar sponsored by Providence Consulting, Relief Devices, DOT, and OSHA, Insight for Pressure Relief Systems Engineers Trying to Make Sense of Fuzzy Jurisdictional Boundaries. Our speaker is Justin Phillips. Justin Phillips has over 10 years of onshore and offshore oil and gas process engineering and project execution experience. His technical experience includes process design with specialty in flare and relief systems. Justin is the Relief Systems Line of Service Manager at Providence Consulting, LLC. He holds a BS in Chemical Engineering from Texas A&M University in College Station, Te College Station, Texas, and is a licensed professional engineer in the state of Texas. One quick note before I turn this session over to Justin Phillips, as described more fully on this slide, the American Institute of Chemical Engineers assumes no legal liability or responsibility for the use or misuse of the content in this webinar. And now I'd like to welcome Justin Phillips. Hello, Justin. Hi, Pam, um, and hello for everybody else. Um, really glad to be here, really glad to give this presentation today. Um, so a couple of a quick things that I wanted to, to, to get out there before we really get into the webinar. Um, one, Pam, thank you very much uh, for your support and for, for clicking around and like doing all the stuff that um, is so important for these webinars to function. Really do appreciate it. Um, to the audience, I have been fortunate enough to give um, several of these webinars over the years, and I'm, I'm glad that you're attending today, and I'm um, also glad for the feedback that we receive after these webinars. So at the end of the webinar, you're probably going to get some, some prompt that's going to ask you for feedback. How was the sound quality? How was the, um, how was the experience? Those types of things. That is really, really important for us. It's also really important for AICHE because we all want to continue delivering things that are useful and beneficial to you as engineers or technicians or, or, or as well other professionals working in this industry. So um, really looking forward to getting your feedback. Um, the other thing is that I, I want to make sure that these webinars are useful, that you can you know, stick them in your back pocket, maybe not literally stick them in your back pocket, but that they're useful, that you can rely on them, you can go back to them um, and, and just have that knowledge available to you. So thank you for, for pre-registering. Um, like Pam said, this webinar is going to be published. There's going to be a PDF version of it. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that we've learned is really beneficial for people is questions and answers. So at the end of this presentation, we're going to have time for Q&A, but it's not going to be forever. Um, and there's going to be questions that we will not be able to get to over the phone. Um, however, go ahead and send those questions to Pam anyway. What we're going to do, we're going to take all of those questions and then, you know, after this webinar is finished today, we're going to answer all of those questions to the best of our ability and make sure that it gets into the published PDF version of this webinar. Um, so something to look forward to if you have a question and it doesn't get answered today. Um, anyhow, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I know that this title is a mouthful, um, but the, the reason for this is because over the years, I've had a lot of experience um, with refining with, with petrochemical um, and then have been lucky enough to get you know, some experience with parts of midstream, with gas processing plants, with some of the transportation, the distribution networks. Um, and what we have found is that it is really awfully confusing sometimes to tell the difference between something that is controlled by DOT, not controlled, but has, you know, jurisdiction under DOT versus OSHA. Um, and my background, and this is, if you, if you don't pick up on it, I'll be very explicit about it. My background is, is really with facilities that are covered by the PSM standard here in the United States. Um, OSHA has the PSM standard, and there's 14 elements that, you know, refineries and chemical plants, they've got to follow this standard. It's federal law. You've got, you've just got to do it. And so I've kind of been groomed to think in that PSM mindset, whereas for facilities that are, that are under DOT jurisdiction, the rules are different. And this is what this is about. So the bias that I have is, is more towards something that has a PSM mindset and not necessarily the DOT mindset. I think that my bias will be appealing to somebody, and for some of those, some of uh, you in the audience, it may be unappealing, uh, but we're going to talk about that as we go through the webinar. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. Purpose of this webinar, um, so if, if you're DOT focused or if you're PSM focused, um, we're going to see what the guidelines are on the jurisdictional authority, like who, who says, um, what do the rules say and how are they applied? Um, 
one of the, the things that we're going to get into specifically is because, you know, I'm a pressure relief systems engineer, kind of run a group of pressure relief systems engineers and do that type of work. What are the specific differences? What are the, what is the difference in the rules um, and how you have to apply some of the, you know, the mechanical things um, to your pressure relief system design and then kind of higher up? What, is the, what are the differences in philosophy? Um, and then the other thing, like I, like I mentioned earlier, is I want the audience to be able to use this webinar as a quick reference um, in their, their work now and in the future. Um, who do I think that the audience is? One, this is one of the things we have to do. We have to tailor our presentations to the audience. My, my bet, my guess, is that we've got people from one of two parties, mostly. Um, one is going to be U.S. midstream terminal and transport um, type uh, professionals, people who work in you know terminals, people who work for pipeline companies, and then the other set of people, maybe folks who work in refining or petrochemical chemical plants, um, that kind of have that PSM uh, focus already. Quick agenda: uh, we're going to go over DOT FEMSA and OSHA PSM. We're going to go over history of those things, look at what's like a high level, what are the rules. Um, we're going to talk about the jurisdictional boundaries, um, what they supposedly should be, and then how it can get a little bit contentious between the two jurisdictions. Um, Going to get into some of the specifics, uh, the similarities, differences, and the impact on pressure relief system design for PSVs, for instance. And then we're going to go over one real-life anecdote that I think is pretty interesting. Real quick, um, acronyms, the very front of this presentation is loaded up with, you know, the stuff that you want to go back and reference quickly. So we're going to go over it real quick. DOT is the Department of Transportation. FEMSA is the Pipeline and Hazardous Material Safety Administration. OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And PSM is the Process, is process Safety Management. Um, definitions, and th these are terms that are, that are pretty important. Um, transporting gas, what is transporting gas? What does that mean? It means, legally, the gathering, transmission, and distribution of gas by pipeline or the storage of that gas. Uh, transporting hazardous liquid is the movement of hazardous liquid by pipeline or the storage of hazardous liquid incidental to the movement of hazardous liquid by pipeline. A pipeline facility is a pipeline, right-of-way, facility, building, or equipment used in transporting uh, gas or hazardous liquid. Um, and a process is any activity involving a highly hazardous chemical that's, that's uh, OSHA, PSM speak, including any use, storage, manufacturing, handling, um, or the on-site movement of those chemicals in combination with other activities. Brief overview in history. So on the left-hand side, we've got kind of the DOT, um, the things that we're talking about on the DOT side, and then on the right-hand side, uh, the things that we're talking about with OSHA, with PSM. So back in the late 1960s, um, we had the development of two acts, um, and also in the 1970s. First, it started off with natural gas, and then there was one in the late 1970s for, for liquid. It's the, you know, the movement and transportation of those things through pipelines. Um, in 2004, FEMSA was started. That's you know, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Um, and they're really tasked with, with enforcing or making sure that those two acts, those two sets of federal laws, are enforced um, for the places where they have jurisdiction. Similarly, in 1970, uh, OSHA was formed, which, you know, it's a very, very large government agency. It, has, it does a number of different things. But for us, the thing that we care about the most is the PSM standard, uh, which was started up in 1992. Quick overview of the relationships. So um, PSM is kind of enforced by OSHA. OSHA is the, the police that enforces PSM, and they're under the Department of Labor. Um, on the other side, we've got another big giant government bureaucracy called the Department of Transportation. Uh, under the DOT, there is the Office of Pipeline Safety, sometimes called OPS or OPS. Under them is FEMSA, and FEMSA is responsible for enforcing uh, this part of federal law called 49 CFR and then sections 190 through 199. The ones that we care about the most today are going to be 192 and 195. A little bit of history. Um, so Congress created the created FEMSA within the DOT, and their agency's mission is to protect people and the environment, um, basically to by making sure that we have um, safe transportation of gas and liquids through pipelines.
but let's be careful here. There was there, it's something funny um, in our in our kind of like research into the history of all of these things, um, and you can see it in the definition, like the way that they were the way that they were created. Um, FEMSA was never intended, and and they've said so themselves. They've never been intended to protect workers, and so this kind of strikes me as odd because coming from the PSM mindset, the PSM background. It's very strange, right? Because I'm thinking about workers. I'm thinking about the safety of workers that are inside refineries or chemical plants or, or what have you. Um, and so I, like, I, I focus on rules that are related to the protection of workers. But you've got another government agency, FEMSA, that's responsible for protecting the public and the environment, not specifically workers. It's a different, different point of view. So again, here we have um, FEMSA taking care of uh, the Code of Federal Regulation 190 through 199, which protects public property and the environment. Uh, the ones we're going to focus on today are 192 and 195. 192 is for the transport of natural gas, typically, and 195 is for the transportation of hazardous liquids, um, except for LNG. LNG is part of um, 193, but that is another topic for another time. Back to definitions. Um, the reason I get back to definitions is because it's these definitions that are that are written into the law, and it's and it's these definitions and the way that they're written which gives the authority uh, to these folks to have the jurisdiction where they have it. Um, what is transporting gas? Transporting gas is the gathering, the transmission, and the dis or the distribution of gas by pipeline or the storage of gas in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce. Transporting hazardous liquid is the movement of hazardous liquid by pipeline or the storage of hazardous liquid incidental to the movement of hazardous liquid by pipeline in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce. These definitions really do seem innocuous, but they create problems. A pipeline facility is a pipeline, a right-of-way, a facility building, etc. Uh, used in transporting gas or treating gas during its transportation or used and intended to be used in transporting hazardous liquid. Part 195, um, there's a couple of exclusions that are written into Part 195 that are, that are significant um, that Part 192 does not have. Part 195 specifically excludes the transportation of hazardous liquid through production, refining, or manufacturing facilities as well as the storage of implant uh, storage or implant piping systems associated um, with those refineries or chemical plants, whatever. So what that means, what it practically means, is that say you've got a refinery or a chemical plant and you've got pipes between your units. Um, you know, you've got, uh, let's say, a crude unit and it's going to send its, its bottoms to a coking unit. And you, instead of doing it, you know, um, through the air in a pipe rack, let's say that you did it underground for some reason. Um, well, that's transporting liquids, which are probably hazardous, underground, um, and that's a pipeline. But what this says is that, well, Part 195, FEMSA has no jurisdiction over it because it's inside of a refinery. It's inside of one of these processing facilities, and that, that seems to make sense. Um, the other thing that 195 excludes is the transportation of materials through transportation terminals, um, like, a, like a terminal facility. Um, if there is transfer from like by pipeline to the terminal and then the terminal turns around and then um, puts that liquid into a tanker car or a, or a rail car. If it does something like that, if that facility um, switches between modes of transportation between pipeline and something else, then Part 195 does not apply and FEMSA does not have jurisdiction. Part 192 is interesting because it does not have those, exempt it, it does not have those exemptions or anything similar to them. And that's kind of where the friction begins, because if you're transporting something inside, inside of your facility, underground, through a pipeline, and it's a gas, well, Part 192 doesn't specifically exclude that. And that's where you start to get some of this friction, some of the contention uh, between the different standards. And not necessarily from the government agencies, possibly within your own, within your own company if you happen to have one of these facilities. Now let's talk about OSHA. So 
background on OSHA, if, if you've attended any of my webinars in the past, you've probably heard all this before, but if you're new to OSHA, if you're new to PSM, this will be you know, kind of a learning, learning experience. So Congress enacted the OSHA Act back in 1970 to address worker and workplace safety. Um, and it, you know, it does a number of things. OSHA, it, OSHA covers practically every facet of every industry in the United States. Um, as most of you know, over the, over the years, you know, from the, from the Industrial Revolution through today, there's been you know, accidents, bad things happen. Um, and basically, the United States got fed up with it and decided, you know what, everybody needs to meet a minimum standard for process safety management. Some companies were already doing these things and doing them very well. Other companies were falling short. And so the United States wanted to set, a, set the bar, set a minimum bar for process safety management for certain types of industry with certain quantities of certain chemicals. Um, and that's why they got the PSM started in 1992. Basically, PSM is a set of requirements for pre preventing or minimizing the consequences of a catastrophic release of toxic, reactive, flammable, or explosive chemicals. The PSM standard regulates processes. It, it's not specific to a type of equipment or a specific piece of equipment. It's not specific to pressure vessels, for instance. It's not specific to pieces of pipe inside of a facility. It's not specific to reactors. Um, it's specific to processes. And as process engineers, if you're a process engineer, um, we recognize that processes can be any number of different things. You know, you've got vessels, you've got, you've got um, prime movers, you've got pumps, you've got compressors, you've got all pipes, you've got all kinds of cool stuff. Um, PSM covers the process, which, you know, encompasses a lot of different types of pieces of equipment. Um, but it's not every process, it's only those that have a threshold quantity, a TQ, of certain predefined highly hazardous chemicals, HHCs. Um, and that, that TQ is 10,000 pounds. And then I've got my definition of process. Again, the definition of process is important because it's defined um, in, a, in a federal law. And it's, you know, it's these definitions written into the federal law that wield so much power. Um, a process is any activity involving a highly hazardous chemical, including any use, storage, manufacturing, handling, or the on-site movement of such chemicals, or a combination of these activities. For purposes of this definition, any group of vessels which are interconnected and separate vessels which are located such that an HHC could be involved in a potential release shall be considered in a, as a single process. Um, so what that says is you may have a contained process inside of your facility um, that, that meets your, your TQ, but if there's something else nearby, um, something that is interconnected, if you've got pipelines that run together, maybe they, don't, maybe they don't jump or into each other, but they run close enough together, if you've got different processes, different pieces of equipment that are close enough together, the, the proximity and the ability of one release to cause another um, may involve both of those processes. What it practically means is that if you've got a refinery, basically everything, even if it's not a highly hazardous chemical, is probably covered by PSM. For instance, your utility headers. Um, water is pretty safe, um, but if it's interconnected with you know, a heat exchanger network, which is then interconnected with a bunch of highly hazardous chemicals, it's probably also covered by PSM. One of the things that OSHA did, right when they got started with the act, not immediately, but pretty soon after, um, no, actually, I think it was written into the law itself. So what they did was what's called the OSHA preemption. And basically, the, the, the short version is that preemption is that if, if OSHA wants to apply its rules to a certain type of place, um, but that certain type of place, that, that workplace or that industry or that facility, if it's already covered by another federal agency, then OSHA is preempted um, from, from having any jurisdiction over it. Um, the, the quote from the law is, nothing in this act shall apply to working conditions of employees with respect to which federal agencies exercise statutory authority or prescribe or enforce standards or regulations affecting occupational safety or health. Now, this is a little bit different from what FEMSA does. FEMSA is, you know, remember, specifically, exclude, they're not intended to do worker safety. Um, they're intended to protect the environment, to protect 
um, facilities, you know, like equipment, and to protect um, the public, but not workers. It's not intended to protect workers. This is fuzzy for sure because it makes it sound like if FEMSA has jurisdiction over a facility and specifically kind of excludes workers, that OSHA might also cover the same facility, right? It's, it's really kind of confusing. Um, but it just taking a step back, it does kind of follow that one agency's rules should not be mixed up with another agency's rules um, because you don't want to apply two sets of rules. You, you'd be having two masters, and what if the rules are contradictory to one another? So the best bet is to keep them separate. Um, just keep one jurisdiction separate from the other jurisdiction. Makes it simple, right? Right? Well, you would think that, but you'd be wrong. Um, both, the, both the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, which is part of OSHA, um, and the courts have rejected people trying, not people, but have rejected companies, industries, trying to preempt themselves out of OSHA coverage um, by trying to say that they are not PSM, they're not PSM covered, they're not covered by OSHA because they're fairly well regulated by another government agency. Um, there was a pretty famous court case in 2002 between, uh, with Mallard Bay Drilling, um, Mallard Bay Drilling essentially wanted to say we are not covered by OSHA. We don't. We we are you know we, we have drilling facilities and so anything related to um, worker safety is not covered by OSHA. It's covered by some other other government jurisdiction. Um, well, the Supreme Court disagreed and they said that's not true because the other federal agencies under which you have jurisdiction they don't cover worker safety. OSHA does. Therefore, for worker safety reasons, you are an OSHA covered. Um, industry, OSHA-covered company, your facilities are covered by OSHA. Um, so this is where you might get some additional friction between OSHA having authority or FEMSA having authority. But that's not to say that, you know, OSHA and, uh, did not think about this, um, that uh, when, the, when the PSM standard was rolled out that they didn't think about the potential overlap between um, OSHA and FEMSA, especially for you know midstream or transportation facilities, um, and you can see that they. So part of OSHA was to preempt themselves from other from from having jurisdiction if there was another government agency with jurisdiction, and that was you know back in 1970 or 1972. And then the other thing that they did is, as soon as they rolled out the PSM standard, was that OSHA entered into a memorandum of understanding uh, with FEMSA, with the Department of Transportation. I want to talk about those. So we have a memorandum of understanding. It's kind of a general big idea, and we have letters of understanding. And this is, you know, over the course of several years, over the decades. So back before PSM was even created, before it was started, uh, back in 1972, OSHA and DOT entered into this memorandum of understanding um, in which the agencies agreed that when questions arose, um, about application of OSHA to something that may be covered by the DOT, that they would talk about it, um, that they would try to, you know, figure it out, try not to cause too much confusion. Um, they just under, this is an understood thing. They would get together and figure it out. Um, then in 1992, uh, after the PSM rollout, OSHA, with the Office of Pipeline Safety, um, they knew that there were specific instances or specific types of situation in, where employers, um, facilities may get confused about who has jurisdiction. Is it going to be DOT or is it going to be OSHA? What do we do? Um, so they determined that the Pipeline Safety Regulation 192 um, addresses the hazards of fire and explosion and therefore OSHA does not need to enforce the PSM rule over um, pipelines, about over anything with transporting gas, but specifically gas transmission and distribution, not not processes above ground. There was another letter in 1998 where OSHA extended the preemption to LNG distribution. Um, so uh, for Part 193, again, we're not going to talk about that one today, but for LNG um, transportation and distribution, not the facilities themselves, but the transportation and distribution, not covered by TSM. Um, 
and, and I, I try to like draw attention to it, these interpretations, these letters of understanding specifically preempted OSHA from the transmission and distribution process, which is all the underground stuff, mostly underground stuff, um, not the processing facilities, not the places where you have the big processes going on. Um, OSHA believes that OSHA has coverage. The PSM standard applies to those types of facilities. Um, there was a, a final rule that was written, and it did have some detractors from it um, that said, no, if, it, if, it's, if it's covered by a pipeline and it goes into a facility, that FEMSA should cover the facility as well. Well, the final rule said no. Um, OSHA covers those facilities, and FEMSA covers the pipelines. So we're at about our halfway mark, um, a little bit more than halfway. Let's kind of summarize real quick, real briefly, what we've talked about so far and kind of what, what the main ideas are. So one, in general, um, OSHA starts where DOT ends, right? So if you've got FEMSA having control of your pipeline, FEMSA has jurisdiction all the way up to where that pipeline comes out of the ground, has a big old valve on it right before it goes, you know, across the fence line into your battery limits and gets processed in your facility. Two, um, the OSH Act includes a provision, it's called the exemption, um, limiting OSHA's jurisdiction if, it's, if a facility or place already has um, regulation by another, another federal agency. Um, that preemption only applies if the other federal agency's regulation address occupational safety. Uh, back in 1972, OSHA and DOT agreed to communicate whenever questions arose about jurisdiction. Um, and then in 1992, OSHA and DOT agreed that PSM is preempted for gas transmission and distribution, um, but they disagreed about gas processing facilities. They said PSM applies to gas processing facilities. Moving forward. Um, so for, for some of you if, you, if you're in the audience and you work um, for, a, for a midstream company or, or part of a larger company that has a midstream component where you've got terminals, this is where it, it really does get hairy, where you're wondering, is it DOT? Or maybe you're not wondering at all. Maybe you already know. Um, but others that are kind of new to it, they have to step in and they have to understand where's the jurisdiction. Um, because even inside of terminals, there's lots of parts, even if it's inside the fence line, that are still DOT covered. Um, there's a very specific set of rules for that. Um, or is it PSM covered? And so this is kind of a joke. Um, but if you can imagine, if you can imagine pickup sticks as a, a a game. I don't even know if they make the game anymore, but it's a bunch of different colored sticks, and you, you throw them out, and you, know, you get them all over the floor, like this picture kind of depicts. Um, it kind of, to me, looks like a like a DOT isometric, a jurisdictional isometric. So these terminal facilities may be color coded. The isometrics will be color coded with different colors, meaning DOT covered, PSM covered, um, and that type of thing. So if you have a DOT isometric in front of you, and you look at this picture, you might get the joke, and you might laugh. Or you might laugh, might not laugh at all. Maybe it's not funny. Moving on. Um, how do you make sense of the boundaries? Well, there's three big factors. Um, these are general rules. Um, three factors to consider when you're trying to figure out if it's DOT or if it's OSHA. The first is the fluid phase that the facility handles. Is it gas or liquid? That's important to know. The second are the modes of transportation into and out of that facility. Does it come in by pipeline? Does it leave by pipeline? Does it not come in by pipeline? Does it not leave by pipeline? Um, and then also, are there any processes that are non-transportation related? Um, for instance, fractionation. If you've got a demethanizer, deethanizer, depropanizer, debutanizer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, do you have dehydration systems? A lot of, a lot of midstream facilities, a lot of terminals do have de dehydrators, right? Um, there's a couple of other things that might point to a facility having a process which is PSM covered. Um, in midstream, and I, and I think that this is where a lot of the confusion exists, this is really what prompted Provenance Consulting to really start looking into this, is that we've got great, some of, it, some of it's really cut and dry, right? But some of it is not cut and dry. Some of it is very gray and kind of fuzzy, um, to point back to the title of this presentation. Then those are in terminals, one. Um, it's also rail cars and trucks, and it's also an underground storage, um, for instance, cavern storage. Um, if you're interested in those gray areas, I, stay tuned. Don't, like, drop off the call immediately when we get towards the end, but stay tuned because I've got some information about where you can 
learn some additional information about those gray areas. All right, so far we've, we've finished talking about DOT and OSHA, you know, stop, we're finished focusing on them. Um, so we've talked about FEMSA, talked about PSM, just we talked about jurisdictional boundaries and how confusing they can be. Um, what I would like to do now is talk about rules specific to pressure relief devices. And so one of the first questions that may come up is where do you even look for the rules that govern a pressure relief system design between PSM and FEMSA? Um, and this will be very similar to the way that you do it if you're you know, a PSM covered facility. One of the things I've um, given a webinar on before, start with your company standards. That's a really good place to start. This is the book of information, if you're so lucky to get a book, um, that has your company's way of doing things. It lists out their standard business practices. It probably also contains um, pointers, uh, maybe company-specific rules about how to do pressure relief system design, for instance. Um, the next set of how-tos, so after, you know, after you've got your internal standards, maybe it points to some consensus standards, some how-to stuff. Examples of that would be maybe API 520, uh, part one and part two, or maybe API 521, or maybe API 2000. Um, nice, well-known consensus standards. Uh, the next item that you're going to be pointed to is probably the codes of construction. So if you've got pressure vessels, probably ASME Section 8. Um, if you've got pipelines, if you've got pipe, it's going to be um, part of the ASME B31 series. And then finally, the regulations. So the last thing you probably ever think about is the regulations themselves. Um, we talked about Part 192, Part 195. Uh, for pipelines, and then, you know, on the other side, on PSM, we've got 1910.119 as far as federal laws go. Um, quick comparison of the laws. So this is, you know, we're going to talk about side-by-side -side comparison, then we'll go to a, a tiny bit deeper. We're going to go one level deeper on each of these things. Um, but starting from the highest, the law of the land, the federal law of the land. For FEMSA, um, the regulations, the law is 49 CFR 192 and 195. And you don't have to pay to see these laws. It's, it's federal law, and so they are, it's available to the public um, for free, and you can look it up online. There is what's called ECFR. I guess it means electronic uh, codes of federal regulation. You can look up Part 195, Part 193, Part 192, um, all of it, and just look through to see what the law is. Um, likewise, on the PSM side, you can look at the entire PSM standard, the entire you know, length of 29 CFR 1910.119 aka PSM standard. Um, for codes of construction, what's different between PSM and FEMSA? Typically for pipelines, you've got ASME B31-4, which is liquid transmission pipelines, and you've got ASME B31-8, which is gas transmission pipelines. Again, transportation, lots of pipelines, it makes sense that those would probably be the codes of construction that you would use. Um, on the flip side, for PSM, a lot of facilities are, you know, you know, refineries, chemical plants, things like that. They've got plenty of pressure vessels, so one of the codes of construction is going to be ASME Section 8. Um, if you've got uh, boilers, it's going to be power boilers, ASME Section 1. Makes sense. If you've got piping interconnecting those things, which you certainly do, uh, you're going to follow ASME B313, which is specifically for process piping. And then as far as consensus standards go, on the PSM side, it's kind of like the same thing we've always seen, we've always used, we've used it for decades, API 520, Part 1 and Part 2, for instance, API 521, API 2000, so on and so forth. For FEMSA side, it's ostensibly, you know, the same set of consensus standards when it comes to pressure release system design. Again, API 520, Part 1 and Part 2, 521, um, that sort of thing. So nothing, nothing too different. Um, but the, the federal regulations and the codes of construction are certainly different. Let's talk about the regulations themselves. So FEMSA regulations, so we've got um, subparts of 192 and subparts of 195. Um, likewise, we have subparts of 1910-119 that we can look at. So specific to pressure relief system design. On the PSM side, it's a very, very short subsection, D3D. It's, it's part of your PSI, your Process Safety Information Requirements. It says that you shall have relief system design and design basis, and that's it, period. It's not a whole lot of words. It intends a whole lot of work and a whole lot of stuff 
but it's really, really simple. It just says you have to have a relief system design and design basis for your pressure relief systems. That's it. On the FEMSA side, um, it doesn't say that. It says, a, it says a couple of different things, not terribly different, but a couple of things. It says uh, in 192 for gas, gas transmission, you've got to protect against accidental overpressuring. Okay. Um, 199 says it has requirements for design of pressure relief or limiting devices. Um, 201 ha tells you about required capacity of pressure relieving devices. Um, and then for the liquid side, there's a, a subsection for the overpressure safety devices and overfill protection systems for liquid systems. Um, but notice that none of the, none of the federal regulation on the FEMSA side says you have to have a relief system and design basis. Um, it makes sense that you probably would, but it's not a it's not a rule that you specifically have a design basis for it, which I think is a very interesting difference. As far as codes of construction go, um, not going into the detail of, of the specific subsections, but for reference, if you wanted to go look them up and you've got access to these standards, which you do have to pay for, um, B314, um, subsection 452.2, and then for B31.8, subsection 845.21, 845.24, and 845.3. Um, for ASME Section 8, well, if you, if you happen to have pressure vessels um, in conjunction with anything that is, has FEMSA jurisdiction, well, ASME Section 8 is going to be the place to go, probably. For PSM codes, uh, codes of construction would be ASME Section 8, again. Um, for relief system design, or not design, but for relief systems requirements on pressure vessels, you would go to UG 125 through UG 140. Um, and then if you've got process piping, the cool thing, I think it's cool, uh, the cool thing about ASME B313, for process piping, if the, the relief system requirements it's really easy. With a, with a few minor exceptions, it basically points right back to ASME Section 8. It doesn't have its own specific requirements, except for those small exclusions, but it really points back to ASME Section 8, so it makes it really, really simple um, when you're trying to, use, when you're trying to um, ensure that your design for pressure release systems is consistent. And then as far as uh, the standards that we would use to do stuff, so in PSM, 520, Part 1, Part 2, 521, those, the entire documents are nothing but pressure relief systems. Um, with FEMSA, it's not, ex it's not explicit anywhere, but if everybody else is using that standard here in the United States to, to size a relief device, to install a relief device, to size for potential overpressures for relief devices and, and protected equipment, it kind of makes sense that you would use the same standards. Let's talk about some of the fundamental differences, though. Um, the differences that I look at that I, that I find striking are at the very, very tip-top level. Um, PSM explicitly requires a relief system design and design basis. It's explicit. You have to have it. It is something that if OSHA comes into your facility and you don't have it, you're in big trouble. Um, FEMSA, on the other hand, implicitly requires a relief system design basis. And it's implicit only because it says you need to protect against overpressure. And protect against overpressure, you have to know what kind of overpressure, how much, how am I going to size for it. it doesn't say you need to, it doesn't say you need the basis. It's not explicit. It is kind of implicit, though. Um, but without that explicit guidance, you would go back to your company standards, which might require you to develop that design basis anyway. Um, in, the present, in my experience, there's a, there's a correlation between non-existence of relief system design and a lack of explicit requirements. So if nothing told you you had to do it, it's no surprise that there is no design basis. Some other differences, and Pam, I know we're running up on time. I know that we wanted to save 15 minutes for questions, so I'm not going to try to rush the anecdote at the end, um, but this means that if you've got questions already, go ahead and send them to Pam. Um, you sent, sent it to host. Pam is going to get those things all written down so that we're able to answer some of them today and some of them later when we publish. So I just wanted to say that real quick. Other differences. In the regulation, as well as the design codes, there are only a handful of relief system differences between FEMSA and PSM-covered uh, PSM covered facilities. Um, and they're, they're very, it's minu this is really minutia now. So if you are a pressure relief systems engineer doing pressure relief system design on pipeline, this is gonna make, this is gonna be really interesting for you. And if you're not, it might not be so interesting. Um, 
So it, I think it's pretty cool, but it says in for gas, you don't need to protect a gas distribution system that has a maximum allowable operating pressure less than 60 PSI if you've got a decent, and I use the term decent, upstream regulator, um, nor piping that has an MAOP greater than 60 if you have two decent regulators, which is really, really different. This is very different from PSM because we are not allowed to use, well, that's not technically true. We are typically not allowed to use control valves or control devices, pressure regulators, to protect us against overpressure. It's very different. It's something you never, never, never do, um, except for some very specific situations. And so it's just kind of strange and different to see that you can get away with using a regulator to protect against overpressure. The other thing, and these are kind of, this is some kind of weird stuff. But uh, in 192, 199, it prohibits having PRD supports that are combustible. Um, like wood. So if you, if you can imagine a PSV that's installed, it's vertical and upright, and then it has a tailpipe which probably comes out um, horizontally and then has an elbow and then extends vertically. Typically there's a, not typically, but sometimes there's a support underneath that elbow to hold it up, make sure it doesn't sag. Well, you're specifically prohibited in federal law from using a piece of wood to hold it up, um, which is kind of an interesting, very specific thing that's written into federal law, and there's probably a good reason for it. Um, but anyway, pretty kind of interesting sidebar on that. Uh, 192, 199, 199 specifies that PRDs installed at regulator stations have to be protected from vehicles, um, which is also interesting. But now, every time you're driving out on the road, maybe in the country, and you see kind of a, if you happen to see it, kind of a gas distribution regulation station, and you happen to see the PSV, and you can see the, the, the telltale weather cap that's sitting there, you always notice that it's behind kind of concrete bars and stanchions and you see that everywhere, and well, now we know the reason, because it's written in a federal law. They have to be protected like that, probably from some really good reason. Other differences. So 192.201 gives you permission to use a, a pressure relief device to protect the operability of, of equipment, um, which I think is kind of interesting, because on the PSM side, you typically are discouraged from using a PSV to protect the operability of something, you're usually protecting something from overpressure, from, a lot, from having the MAWP be exceeded. That's what a PSV is for. Um, but on the FEMSA side, you can use it to protect the operability. I don't like that because it puts more demand on the PSV more frequently um, than if it was only there to protect against overpressure, which would be a you know, higher pressure threshold than just the operability level. Um, and then also some differences is that um, the accumulations on pipelines are a little bit different. So if you're thinking about PSVs in, in a regular facility, you've got from 15 PSIG up to 30, you get um, 3 PSIG of accumulation. Then above 30, you get 10% accumulation for most scenarios, whereas it's just a little bit different on the pipeline side. Oh, and then the other thing. Again, using non-pressure relief devices like a regulator or a control valve to protect against overpressure, um, which is just strange. It's very strange if you come from a PSM kind of background. All right, so I see that it's now 11.45. I think the anecdote's going to take about five minutes, so that'll leave us about 10 minutes for questions. Um, it's just an interesting story, at least I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, but One Oak has, a, has the Bushton facility, which is a fractionation, um, has caverns, it has, you know, in-plant piping systems. And the ba basically the way that it works is that it gets NGLs um, from a pipeline. It's all, it's all FEMSA regulated. That's well known. Makes sense. It processes the NGL. Uh, for instance, it goes through fractionation, so they break it down into its, its, uh, its constituent components. And then it sends the products from the fractionation back into FEMSA regulated pipeline, but it also sends it to other modes of transportation, probably, if not rail car, then probably tanker truck. One Oak had determined that the pipelines in and out of the facility, um, they are FEMSA regulated. They said, well, our in-plant piping leading up to, you know, any, leading up to the battery limits, everything inside the battery limits is not FEMSA covered because, you know, obviously we have this big 100, 200 foot tall fractionation system. We've got some associated things. We kind of send some of our products to non-pipeline. So everything inside should not be FEMSA covered.
which seems to make sense because 195, and this is for, for liquids, which liquids is what they got, um, li the liquids, the CFR, specifically excludes transportation of those liquids through the production, refining, or manufacturing facilities, as well as any storage that they might have, and also for the implant piping. That's what's kind of great about uh, 195 is that it has those specific exclusions. However, back in 2005, um, the OPS wanted to do a pipeline safety inspection, so, you know, they're coming along the pipeline doing their regular inspections, and they get up to the fence line, and they kind of grab onto the fence, and they shake it, and they say, hey, we want to go inside your facility and do a safety inspection. And One Oak was like, mm, I don't think so. Um, this is not FEMSA jurisdiction. Well, FEMSA disagreed, um, and after some back and forth and some lawyers were involved, One Oak said, okay, okay, parts of the inside of the facility are covered by 195, but not everything, so come and do your inspection. Well, there was some continued back and forth for several, like several years um, into the, uh, anyway, for several years, and it persisted, um, and One Oak said, you know what, I think that this entire facility is excluded from FEMSA jurisdiction because in Part 195, it says that you exclude production, refining, and manufacturing. Right, they pointed to FEMSA's own laws that they're supposed to be enforcing. Well, FEMSA didn't like that very much. They said, no, 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 no. Um, fractionating is not refining because there's no change in chemical characteristics. Um, a change in chemical characteristics, change in chemistry is not taking place. Now, I had to, I had to pause when I read this um, because as a chemical engineer, I find that kind of a strange point of view. I think that fractionation um, is kind of like refining. You don't have to change the chemical composition of something. Um, you're not having, you don't have to have reactions to be processing or, or or refining, so that was kind of a weird argument, but nonetheless, moving on, um, FEMSA did conclude that the One Oak facility is a materials transportation terminal that happens to have a fractionation plant on its grounds, and that the presence of the fractionation plant, like the fractionation equipment itself, does not necessarily exempt it from the rest of the law, from the rest of the, the 195 law. To me, that kind of demonstrates how FEMSA reached further into facility um, further into the fence line than it had ever done previously because kind of the way that the law is written and the way that I understood it and I think a lot of other people, especially One Oak, understood it was that FEMSA stops at the, at the, at the chain link fence. They stop when that pipe pops out of the ground at the valve before it goes in and starts being processed. Quick meme if you're into memes. Um, I'll save that for the I guess for the published version, you look at it, have a laugh, or not have a laugh. Now, this is the part where we have further information. Um, if you are interested in learning more about making the determination, the correct determination, or um, what the determination should be for jurisdictional authority around those gray areas, when we talked about um, tanker trucks and rail cars and terminal facilities especially, um, and caverns, we, my colleague Lauren Mercer is doing a presentation at AICHE uh, next week um, on April the 23rd at 2 p.m. So if you're able to attend the AICHE spring meeting, by all means, go and have a look at that. Um, there's also a paper associated with it. Might have some pretty good information. Now it's time for Q&A. Um, Pam, is there any questions? There are some questions and people can um, send in more as well uh, to me in the chat box and um, we'll add them to the list. So first one, how do the DOT regulations affect movement by rail cars or tank trucks? So I specifically excluded the rail car and the tank trucks from this presentation um, and it's something that Lauren is going to cover next week, um, but it, it depends on whether or not those tank trucks, rail cars are going to sit inside of your facility, whether or not they're immediately going to leave the facility um, for, for rail cars, whether or not those rail cars are sitting on company-owned tracks um, or not sitting on company-owned tracks. There's, you know, a couple of different variables which will help you determine whether or not something is um, DOT covered or PSM covered. Good question, though. Okay, thank you. Shouldn't boundaries be defined so the jurisdiction can be defined? Right, right. I think that's, I mean, that's the whole point, and that's what, that's what owner-operators and employers have to put up with um, is, you know, they, you think you've got it down. You think you've got your DOT isometric correct. Um, One Oak, in the anecdote that we, we talked about, thought that they had it correct, and then FEMSA came in and 
decided something kind of different than the intent of the law that they're supposed to being supposedly that they are enforcing, but they interpreted it different than anybody else did. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things. It would be easier, but hey, here we are. Okay, thanks. How does the EPA RMP rules apply in relation to the preemptions? It seems to align mostly with the OSHA PSM rules. I would agree with that. I think that that may be a long-winded answer. I'm going to save that one for the published version. Okay. Um, does PHMSA cover the gas compressor stations on the gas transmission pipelines? From what I remember, I think that the answer is yes, because I remember compression stations being in there. Um, I'll answer that one completely in the, in, the, in the published version. Good question. Okay, thank you. If PHMSA can go into a fraction facility, then what is stopping PH, PHMSA from going into a crude unit in a refinery? So that's kind of that, like that's kind of a that's an interesting question and kind of a scary, scary not a scary thought, um, but a scary thought for for some people that would have to pay their lawyers to figure it out. Um, but on an extreme level, if FEMSA can enter can with you know if you've got liquids going into into a facility, a fractionation facility, right? Well, it goes into fractionators and it gets separated out based on boiling point. FEMSA's own rule says that it kind of excludes those facilities, but they've shown that they can go, they can cross your fence line anyway and go into the facility. Um, refining in a, in, a, in, a, in a crude column is much the same, right? You've got liquids, which are probably hazardous, going through a pipeline in most cases, entering into your crude unit um, and being fractionated based on their boiling points. If, if the thing that we talk, if the anecdote is case law, then it may follow that possibly in some sort of weird, bizarre dimension that, yeah, FEMSA could say that they've got some level of jurisdiction into a refinery, into a crude unit, for instance, which is really weird, but they've never done it. I don't know if it's, I don't know if they were picking on One Oak or, um, or what, but it is theoretically possible. Okay, thank you. PSM seems more stringent. If you are a, if you are PSM compliant, would you also be PAHMSA compliant? I think so. So this is where there may be bias in this answer, but I think so. I think you probably would be. I think that SIMSA, however, and 192 and 193 for NGL and 195 have some of their own specific um, sets of rules which are not included inside of PSM. Your pro most of your bases are probably covered if you treat something as PSM. Um, there's probably a couple of specifics that may not be covered, but for the most case, I think you've got your basis covered. So the answer is yes. Okay, thanks. Is it liquid or gas if the fluid is liquid in the pipe but vapor at ambient conditions? Um, liquid. Um, so, it, like, the, from the question, it sounds like maybe propane. Um, so, you, know, you can compress propane, make it a liquid, it's liquid in the pipe, same with butane maybe. But if you let it get out, it's really vo volatile, and it's considered a um, um, highly volatile liquid. So it is considered liquid um, for the pipeline point of view, even if it can turn into a gas once you expose it to atmospheric conditions. Good question. Okay, thank you. This one just came in. Um, if a cryogenic ISO container truck delivers a cryogenic gas into a process facility, do DOT regulations still apply while the truck is inside the process facility? Is the commodity a, a consi is the commodity considered a liquid or gas? Commodity <laughs> is not if the commodity is not kept cold inside the facility. Good question. So I'm not sure about the applicability of 192 or 193 maybe or 195 to this because it didn't come in through a pipeline, it came through a truck. I think that there's another part of, um, uh, of DOT which would cover this situation where you've got really, really cold gas, so cold that it's a liquid, um, but I don't know it off the top of my head. So I'm looking forward to giving a more replete answer in the, in the published version of this. That's a great question. Okay, thanks. I have a pipeline application that is covered by DOT. Do I require a release system design basis? 
Uh, according to federal law, you don't, but you, it also depends on what your company says. Um, if your company standard says you need to have a reason for your PSV installation, the answer is yes, you need to follow your own rules. Um, and then stepping away from any rules that say that you should do this or that, you should probably know why your PSV is installed and why it's sized the way that it is. But legally, eh, maybe not. As bad as okay, that. thanks. When we have a mixture of gases, how do we choose the ratio, how to choose the ratio CP over CV? Can we use a Van der Waals Peng Robinson mixture rule? <laughs> so that's a really specific question to, uh, and it really points towards API 520 part one. Um, you, so to get away from the, the consulting part of that, I'll say you have to use good engineering judgment, but I'll provide a, a better replete answer in, the, in the, uh, the published version of this. Okay, let's try for one more. Um, at our terminal in Kansas, we have a vent stack for DOT PRDs that also has PSVs from our dehydrator, PSM, going to it. Is the vent stack PSM or DOT? So it sounds like there's DOT covered devices going into a vent stack, but there's also PSM covered devices going into the vent stack. Uh, I'm gonna lean towards it being a PSM covered vent stack, um, PSM covered disposal system that would fall under API 521. Okay, this one just in, it'll be our last one. FYAPI, I believe, oh, maybe it's just a comment. FYAPI, I believe, requires the use of ideal gas CP over CV in their sizing equations. <laughs> so, so real gas versus ideal gases. Um, again, try to incorporate in, that into the, the question before last where we had that. Okay. I'm sorry, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Let's see, but if people still um, have questions on their minds or think of one a little later, they're welcome to send it in to me and I will forward it um, to Justin. So now on behalf of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers and everyone who attended today, I'd like to thank Justin Phillips for this informative presentation. Thanks also to our participants for your cooperation and thoughtful questions. Please visit AICHE.org to replay this session or to view and sign up for our many others. A reminder to also please fill out the evaluation form that will appear on screen when you log out. Goodbye and we hope to see you again in a webinar soon.